Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on getting started with Tracer Plus. I am your presenter, Joe Crable, and I am a mobile solutions architect here at TTS. Um, so what we want to go over today is creating custom mobile apps with no program. They're affordable, fully customizable, and easy to integrate. Um, we want to talk about why mobile, why Tracer Plus. Um, Tracer Plus integrates into many backend databases and systems, as well as uh, Excel sheets and text files. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about our easy-to-use form design tools, so you can build enter enterprise class forms. Um, it is powerful and flexible, and I'll talk about a lot of the features. Um, you know, some simple to some complex, like our newly added conditional logic. I'll just touch on that briefly. And uh, Tracer Plus is also able to deploy to a wide variety of devices running Android OS or Windows Mobile and CE. Um, as I spoke of, you can actually design mobile applications uh, for a wide variety of different mobile app uh, different applications, including asset tracking, inventory control, uh, mobile or field inspections, field service, you know, work order type scenarios. We use in the retail area as far as price checking, printing labels, uh, printing receipts, uh, and, and a lot more. Uh, if you can think of it, uh, we can probably do it. Uh, so before I actually get started, uh, some of the resources to actually designing mobile apps. Um, if you didn't want to do it yourself, um, we do offer some resources for you. We have an online solution center. Uh, with pre-canned, pre-built apps that you can use as is or even import into our desktop software and modify. Um, we also offer training videos and webinars just as this one, kind of show you how to get started, um, as well as some of the training videos and feature focus videos um, solely focus on specific features, um, basically the length of a full webinar. We also offer training services um, where we can actually train you in using the application so you can create your own apps. Um, if you feel like you don't have the time to create the apps, we do offer session setup services as well where we can actually uh, take your spec and review it and create the application for you. Uh, so I'm going to get started, uh, but before I do, I just want to let you know if you do have any questions at any point during the webinar, please type them into the question panel, and we will address those at the uh, end of the presentation. All right, so now I'm going to show my first monitor here. And what you're looking at here is our Tracer Plus desktop software. This is what enables you to create your mobile application. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to start off uh, using one of our sample projects. Uh, so you'll see you have a few options here. You can create a new project, open an existing project, or go to our online repository of sample apps. So if I click samples, you'll see that they're organized into eight different categories. Uh, so if it sort of meets your criteria in one of these categories, you can take a look. Um, items that don't fit into the seven major categories usually fall under miscellaneous. Um, so if I look under inspections, for example, um, I see some fire extinguisher inspections, uh, just a generic inspection, uh, an office inspector, trailer safety inspections, insurance claims inspections, uh, even electrical meter inspections. Um, vehicle inspections. So if I actually click one of these, if I look at our motor vehicle safety inspection here, it'll give you a brief description of what the application does as well as gives you uh, a screenshot of the application. So I'll click next and then I'll click the import button. So you'll see that that particular application has what we call a session. Uh, so a session is basically a form with a data table behind it. And with Tracer Plus, you can run up to 32 different sessions uh, on a single device at a single time. 
Uh, this current sesh, uh, project only has a single session. It's for the vehicle inspections. And the first thing we see here is our field settings. Uh, so this is where you can actually create the field of data that you want to collect, as well as name your field and configure your fields um, for different types of uh, fields. Or depending on what type of data you want to collect, you can set uh, different types of field types. Uh, so you'll see we have a list here of 32 fields. Uh, our next tab here is our form designer. So this is a drag and drop environment that allows you to create the form how you want it to look. Um, so you can obviously change colors, fonts, um, add new controls, add buttons, remove buttons, uh, add grids, add images or logos. Uh, but you'll see this particular form has four pages. Uh, so we have our tabs on the side here. And as I flip through those tabs, we can see what our inspection form looks like. So now, say this app is good and we want to use it. Now we just click this Build Deploy button. So with a mobile device connected, uh, we can now deploy this to our connected device. So I'm going to pull that in. I'm connected to a Windows mobile device here. Uh, so if I click this Deploy button, it's going to push our Tracer Plus app to the device, which will auto-launch Tracer Plus. And you'll see our vehicle inspection app. If I go in there, you'll see the form. It should look pretty much the same as what it looked like in our form designer. Uh, so we see we can have a list of inspectors. Uh, we can have makes and models of vehicles uh, where the model filters based on the make entered. And if we were actually quick start inspection, uh, you'll see various check boxes here that you can check off um, you know, as you're doing the inspection. And as well as type in any comments. We can even capture photos. If the device has a built-in camera, we can actually capture photos. Uh, also, we do signature capture. Um, so if you were to tap that field, it could pop up a signature pop-up. That's how quickly you can actually get started with some of our pre-canned apps. Uh, so you'll see there's uh, probably, let's say, 50, 50 to 70 different apps up there. Uh, some designed for Windows Mobile, some designed for Android. But you'll also notice here, um, if I look in our desktop, if we look over here, we see an auto scale form to fit screen. So if you do have a form that's developed or designed for a Windows Mobile device, which is typically smaller, once you deploy this app to an Android device, it will auto scale that to the Android device's resolution. So you don't have to go resizing or redesigning your form. Um, in the event you did want to resize the form, we do have a property for that. So if we go to our form properties, and you know the form dimensions of your device, you can actually select it. And then if I hit apply, you'll see that it's going to resize that form to that particular resolution. So then you can just deploy it, and it should fit your screen nicely. And I just want to show you something on our website. If you are wondering the resolution of your device, um, as we get devices and as we find out, we try to add some of the form dimensions to our compatibility list here. Um, so you can even filter this down by your manufacturer, make of device, or even the operating system. But we try to list as many devices as we can here or as we find out about them, but you'll see different uh, screen resolutions for Tracer Plus listed here. For example, a Cypher Lab RS30 running Android has a portrait form size of 540 by 845, and if you wanted to use that in landscape mode, it would be a 955 by 435. So you'll see most Windows Mobile devices are a standard 240 by 268, uh, but this is really helpful for Android users uh, who don't quite know the resolution of their device for Tracer Plus. So like I said, that's on tracerplus.com. Hover over support, and then click on the compatible hardware. All right, so I'm going to go back to desktop here. And what we're going to do is create an application from scratch. Uh, so I'm going to jump back to our welcome page, and I'm going to create new project. Uh, so the first thing we can do here is actually give our project a name. So let's say we're going to do um, asset tracking. So I'll call this 
call that asset tracker. And for the project itself, we have a few settings here. We can choose what platform we're designing it for, whether it's Windows Mobile or Android, as well as what operating mode of Tracer Plus we're using. I'm using Professional. And there's some other menu settings here where you can actually hide menus, use the device in full screen mode, and even disable keyboard navigation if you really wanted to lock the device down. If we jump over to our admin tab, we have um, user logins can be enabled here where you can actually have people, uh, when they launch Tracer Plus, force them to log in with a username and or password. And also when you require a login, you could prevent access to certain sessions or forms based on the user's credentials. Uh, the launcher screen kind of shows you or I'll let you configure this launcher screen here. So you see how we, by default we show a data entry and a view data tab. So if you didn't want users to be able to view the data that's on the device, you could just click this button here and you'll see that it gets hidden. Uh, we have some connect settings within desktop. Uh, this is our syncing tool, which I'll touch on a little bit after the demonstration. So we'll circle back to that. And lastly is our publish settings, which we will uh, we'll be doing a webinar on this uh, probably in the next month or so on how you can actually custom brand your own mobile applications uh, to basically remove the Tracer Plus branding and put your own branding. Uh, so those are the project settings. Now I'm going to jump over to my session settings. Uh, so we'll see that it created a session one by default. So let's say since we're doing asset tracking, we're probably going to want to load an asset list to the device. Um, so we're going to want to use two sessions here. So I'll add a second one using our plus button under Project Explore. So let's say our first session will be our asset scan. That's the session that we're actually going to be doing our asset scans in. And then our second session can be asset list. So now that we name the session, we want to go ahead and define some fields. Uh, so the first thing we want is an asset tag. And maybe we have a serial number, maybe an asset type such as, you know, PC, monitor, printer, something like that. Uh, you can have a make and a model. And then maybe we want to maintain where it's located. So we'll say current location. And maybe we want to know its condition as well. So we can say current condition. I'll remove all the remaining fields as we only need these seven. And once again, this is only going to be a session that's going to allow us to either add new assets or we can actually sync a list of assets from a database uh, to this session. So now we want to go to our asset scan. So this is the session we're actually going to be working in and actually doing the scanning. Once again, maybe the first thing we select is the location map. And there may be a scan type, whether we're doing an asset move or an asset issue or an asset audit. And then we'll scan our asset tag. We can look up the information about the asset. So we'll enter the same info, serial number, asset type, make and model. And then we'll have a selector to select the condition. And this is more like a transaction session. So you want to record all the scans for a particular asset. We want a date time of when that asset was scanned. So there's our nine fields that we're going to collect during our actual scanning process. So now what we want to do is start defining some of these fields. So a location, that could be something, uh, probably a drop down. We can actually select a uh, location from that. And once we select drop down, you'll see that a drop down options tab appears. So if I click that, um, there's several ways you can add drop down data for the device. One is within desktop here. Um, if you don't have a lot of items or if it's something that's not going to change frequently, uh, this may be a good spot to put your drop down data. 
Um, you can actually key them in here, or you can even import them from a, a text file, ODBC database, or an Excel sheet. Um, so if I actually did look at ODBC and looked at our Tracer Plus Connect sample, um, let's see, we do have an asset locations database here. And then we can choose what display value we want to choose from, and that's our location. So you'll see here I have a table of 10 different rooms. So I can actually import this into our drop-down list within desktop. So that when we deploy this app, this drop-down will be populated with these 10 rooms. Uh, another way to do this, you can actually do a manual text file import to the device itself. Or you can actually sync from text Excel or an ODBC database using our Connect software so that if it is a large list or, or a list that updates periodically, you can actually keep resyncing that list to the device so that it has the most up-to-date drop-down information. Another um, setting for this field, uh, if we're in a particular location and scanning a bunch of assets within that location, we don't want to keep entering those, this location with each scan. So if I jump over to our after scan settings, we can turn off our clear on submit field. So what this means, once we submit a record, this location field we retain so that we don't have to re-enter it again until we move to a different location. So our next field is scan type. Once again, this can be a drop down. Um, so I'll just key into this one so we could say asset move. Asset issue or asset audit. And there's some other uh, drop down options here. We can actually restrict to list items so that only the item can only be selected from the list and you can't type into it. Uh, without this, uh, you can type into the field if the value doesn't exist in the list. We can also sort the items. And then another option that's newly added in 9 is to use the DB value. So we found that a lot of customers, um, even though they're selecting a physical value, when they actually save it to the database and sync back, they usually want some associated ID instead of that display value. So if I want an asset move to be, you know, an ID, a value of 1, this could be 2, this could be 3, and if I check this use DB value, the user will still be able to select from these display values, but when you actually submit that to the data, uh, the database, it'll actually submit as a value of one, two, or three, so that it's sync friendly uh, for a lot of databases that use a lot of related tables based on IDs. I'm just going to remove that because I'm not going to use that in this case. So next we have our asset tag. This is a field that we're going to scan into, so we're just going to leave that one as text. Serial number. So serial number through the model fields, we're going to want to look up from our asset list so that we don't have to type this information in. So what we're going to do is create or enable a lookup option for this field. So we come to the lookup options tab, click the enable lookups, and then we can set where we're going to get this serial number from. Uh, so once we scan an asset tag, we want to look into our asset list, and then we want to define the relationship of how we're going to look this up. We're going to look this up based on the asset tag in our local session, as well as and match that to the asset tag in our remote session. And then we're going to trigger that on our asset tag scan, and then the last thing we want to do is the source field that we're going to pull in, or what we're looking up, which is the serial number. So this is saying we're going to look into the source session based on the asset tag scanned and return the serial number if found. If the asset's not found, we can actually display a not found message in that field stating that the asset is not found. Then we're going to just set that up the same for the remaining three lookup fields. This one is for our asset type. One will be for our asset make. And the last one for our model. All 
Okay, now condition is a drop down field because we'd want to select an asset condition. So I'll select drop down and enter a few conditions here. We could say new, good, fair, needs repair, or damaged, or even maybe end of life. We'll go ahead and sort that list. Last field here is our date time. Uh, so you'll see that we have a data type, and we set that to date time. Click the format button, and then we'd be able to select a custom format or however you want the date and time to display. Uh, you'll see we have a bunch of pre pre-formats available for you, but if you actually just type in using the similar nomenclature here with the M's, D's, and Y's, um, you can actually type out your own custom date format by just typing into this field here. But I'm just going to select some of our pre-canned options here. Okay, so there's our fields. Now we want to uh, sort of design the flow of the application or how it should flow. Uh, so once they enter a location, we're going to say that it should go to the scan type field. And if we go to scan type, this also may be something we don't want to clear on submit because if you're only doing audits, you don't want to keep selecting that. So we could turn clear on submit off. Then after we scan or enter the scan type, we're going to have it go to the asset tag. Now, since we're looking up the serial asset make and model of this asset, we don't need to go to the serial number after we scan the asset. We want to set focus to the next field that requires entry. So I'm going to change this to the condition field so that once we scan an asset, looks up the information and sets focus in our condition field. Now if I wanted to, uh, once we enter a condition, I can have the record auto submit and then return to our asset tag field. So once we choose an option from the dropdown, it's going to submit the record, capturing the data, and then set focus on the asset tag so you can scan the next asset in that location. Another option here, we can set fields as read only. So our date time, you know, maybe we want that visible, but not the uh, user can't edit it. We can do the same for our lookup fields if we don't want them changing serial number, asset type, make, and model. So our field settings have been configured. The next thing we want to do is actually build our form. If I jump over to Form Designer, I can click the Create Default. And we can start making the form look a little nicer. So I'll just move the tab off, as I usually don't like to show the tabs on the device. You can actually use buttons to control the navigation or flow through the form. Um, so I am going to align all of these fields using our alignment tools. Make them all the same width. We make them a little bit wider. I'll select our labels and also move these down a little bit. If I wanted to, I could actually change our background color of the form. We will go with a dark blue here. And we can change the labels on the background to the same color. And then make them a white text. Maybe we want to change our button colors. And maybe we want to bold our button fonts here. And now if I deploy this to my device, we should now see this form as it looks here. If I go into Asset Scan, so you'll notice that we have, uh, these are refresh buttons uh, in case you wanted to refresh the lookup. So what I like to do is typically hide those. Um, so I'll go to the each of those fields. So we have serial number and we have something called hide refresh button. So we want to set that to true for those four, or actually five fields. And then you'll also notice the date auto-populated with the current date time set on the device, which looks to be incorrect, by the way. 
And then also you notice the drop-down fields are not as big as the other fields. Um, so we notice that on newer Windows mobile devices, that's the way drop-down fields display. Uh, so what we usually do is just increase the font size, usually to 14, and that usually will make them the same size as either an 11 or 12 point uh, font. Now if I deploy this again, we should see our changes. So now once we go in the form here, you see that those refresh buttons are gone as well as our drop down fields are now uh, much bigger and the same size as our standard text fields. Here's our drop down data, our scan types, and the conditions that we added. The only thing we need now is assets um, in our list to scan. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to key some in into our asset list. Um, so one thing I also noticed, we can configure this form to input information like I'm going to do now. Uh, but most cases, you may just load this from a database, and this form may not even be, uh, be visible to the user. But I'm just going to enter some random information here. Let's say it's a PC, a make, a bill, XPS, and let's leave its current location and condition blank. I'll add another asset. Say it's a monitor. Okay, that's a Dell. W22S. And we'll add one more. Also another monitor. All right, so now if I go to View Data and look at our asset list, you'll see here's our three assets that I just added. So now if I go back to Asset Scan, I select the location I'm at, select the type of asset scan I'm doing. Let's say we're doing an asset issue, and then I scan in, you know, 1001. Looks like our asset type field I probably didn't set up correctly. So if we just take a look at that, You'll see here I use the invalid relationship. I use asset type instead of asset tag. I'll just correct that. But you'll see that it looked up the other three fields, and then we can actually enter a condition. Say good. And as soon as I selected that condition, you'll see that that record auto submitted, and we now have a record count of one. And also notice that the cursor is focused in the asset tag field. So let me deploy these changes here, just to show you that that should work. If I select our room 101 again, we'll do scan type issue and scan 1002 this time. Now we see the asset type as well as serial, make, and model condition. We'll say good, and then that will auto submit. You'll see that added two new transaction records. Um, so the next thing that people usually like to do is not only record the transactions, but also update the asset list with the most current information. Uh, so there's two ways I could do that. Usually the way we recommend is to actually add a couple extra fields here. And I'll call them update underscore location, and then update underscore condition. So we're going to configure these as a calculated lookup. Uh, so we're going to set each of these field types to calculated. And the calculated portion is basically just a concatenation. So what we want to do is grab the data that we enter into our location field up top. So basically, as soon as we enter that location, it's also going to be populated into this update location field using this calculated concatenation field. And we also want to do another lookup like we set up before. So we look into our asset list based on asset tag. We want to look up the current location 
And the option here that's going to update that is this update source. So that's going to mean that once we select a location and submit this record, it's going to take whatever location we entered and then update our asset list with that location. I'm going to do the same for the condition field. Choose condition, oh, not current condition. We want, actually, yes, we want current condition and we want to update our source. And then we want to set up our calculated field that's going to grab from our condition field. Now, we don't want to see these on the form, so we can set these as not visible. And then we can also choose what fields we want to show in the view data grid. So if we look at our asset list, we're only seeing the four, first four fields. The same is true for the asset scan. So we can actually come back to these other fields and click this show and grid option to show these fields in that data view screen. You'll notice that once you actually do enable that, you can even customize the grid column width. So that if you notice the data is getting cut off, you can make these grid columns uh, larger by default so that that data is not cut off. I'll do the same for our asset list just to show you that we currently don't have any location or conditions set for those assets. So I'll go ahead and deploy this. If we look at our asset list, we now have all those columns, and you'll see that the current location and condition are currently empty. Now, if I come back in here and scan another asset, so let's go to room 102, asset move, say 1001, and then we set its condition to good and submit. Now, if we go back to our asset list, we should see that that row has now been updated with that data. So see our current location updated to room 102 and our current condition updated to good. So now you can actually sync this back to your asset list, updating your main asset table with the current asset state, as well as sync the transactional data from your scans to a transaction type table. It's going to show you a history of all your asset scans. So you'll see that I scanned asset 1001 twice, um, so you'll be able to know you know, when that was scanned, what type of scan it was uh, by looking in that transaction table. So that's the basics of the um, a session set up here. What we could also do is using some condition logic. I'll just give you a little taste of that. Let's say if a user enters, you know, a condition of poor, maybe you want to then display a comments field uh, where the user has to enter a comment about why that uh, asset condition is poor. So I'll add a comments field here. Jump back over to our form designer. And what we'll do is we'll slide some of this stuff back up. Using my keyboard arrows, I can actually move the form. Uh, but date time, maybe we don't want to see the date time as device is just auto capturing that. That doesn't actually need to be visible to the user. So I'll just add a comments field here. So I added the field and I'm going to choose from the right hand side. This is how you can manually add a field after you've uh, built the default form. I just click that field control, place it on the form, and then under our control properties I can select which field that should tie to, so I'm going to set it to comment. And maybe we want this to be a multi-line field, so the user can enter you know, a lot of data to it. Uh, so what we can do is come over here and set multi-line true, and now we can actually size that field vertically. I can also add a label here, we'll call this comments. And now if I deploy this, you'll see that comments field. So in this case, we haven't selected a condition of poor yet, so we don't want that comments to appear by default. 
Uh, so we're going to set up some conditional logic. So the first thing you're going to need to know about conditional logic is that each control on the form has a unique control ID. Uh, so if I click on different controls, you'll see them have different IDs. So we have an ID button here that shows you all the control IDs. As this is what's mainly used in our conditional logic form. If I open that up by clicking this last icon here, now we can actually add um, a logic event. The first event I want to add is on form initialize. So that's when we first go into the form or after we submit a record and the form is refreshed. Uh, that's, that's a form initialize event. So what we want to do is set visible of both control 21 Actually, I'll do 20 and 21. You can do this to multiple controls separated by a comma. So that's our comment and com comments label and field here. So I want to set those as visible false. So that means as soon as we open the form, we're not going to see that comments field. So the next thing we want to do is set up a rule to on after scan. So an after scan that could be either a barcode scan, an enter key press, or when we select a drop down item. So when we do an after scan event in the condition field, which is 19, we want to say actually add an if condition now. We want to say if control 19 equals poor, then we want to set visible 20 and 21 to true, and then we could do an else false. So if it's anything other than poor, we can set it to false and not be shown. So now what I want to do is turn off our auto submit for condition so we can see this happen. I'll go ahead and deploy this. So you'll see that our condition or our comments field is not showing up. So if I select AUL, it shouldn't show up. But as soon as I select, actually, it looks like I don't have a poor condition. So if I actually typed in poor and then hit enter, you'll see that that comments field appeared. If I select something else, it uh, hides itself again. Now we can also enable disable validation using this. So we in the event that they did try to submit where the comments field was visible, we could prevent them from submitting if they leave that blank. Um, so that's also something we can do with logic. I'm not going to show it here. Um, but you'll kind of see what's possible with logic. You can do a bunch of different events, you know, on focus of the field, on loss focus. Um, when a field value changes in a field, when you click a button, you can run logic. On validation, failed or success, you can run logic. When a calc is refreshed, when a lookup's refreshed, when you submit a record, after you do a sync, even on live mode, connect and disconnect, you can uh, shell out certain messages or actions. And when using grid controls, you can even do logic events on some grid inserts and updates. Um, so once again, you have your event control IDs and then as well as your if condition. So that's where you want to do the if then type scenario where if this equals that, do that, or if this equals that, then do that type of thing. Um, some of the actions available are you can click buttons based on certain events. Um, you can execute SQL statements. You can go to controls, go to pages, play sounds, refresh controls. Uh, change the background color of fields or fonts, you know, if, if you want to display a warning message or if uh, a field doesn't validate properly, you could turn it red uh, so it brings it to the user's attention. Um, you can set positions, move things on and off the form, set fields as read-only, set validation, set values in certain fields based on specific events, um, show messages, trigger after scans, and even validate fields. That's a very, very powerful feature. Um, you can act, it opens up a whole lot of different applications uh, for us that we couldn't have done in the past uh, that now we can do with this logic feature. 
I, I just want to touch on some of the other features available in Tracer Plus. Uh, if we go to the Data Capture tab, um, for supported devices, we do. You can enable and disable the barcode scanner as well as uh, the RFID scanner on uh, Zebra devices. Uh, so we have a variety of RFID settings here, including the types of tag format you want to read, um, whether you want to multi-read or read individual tags at a time. You can set your power level. You can read user memory banks on scan as well. Um, another section in this form is um, smart forms. So based on the data that you're keying in or scanning, you can actually direct the data to a specific field regardless of where you're focused. Um, so let's say I did a barcode scan complete. I want that to go to the asset tag field. <coughs> Excuse me. So that means I could be focused on location or scan type or not be focused on any field at all. But if I scan that asset tag, it's automatically going to put it in the asset tag field. Uh, so you can even do that with, if you're scanning a bunch of different barcodes that begin with different letters, you can do a bunch of data begins with, so it doesn't matter where you're focused. You just scan, if it begins with a P, you can stick it in this field. If it begins with a S, you can stick it in it, you know, a serial number field, things like that. So that's true for RFID as well. You can also do with data ends with, data contains, or data has length. Um, I did mention data syncing. Um, so out of the box, Tracer Plus does enable you to import and export delimited text files. Uh, so that's where this is configured here. This is a more manual process where you have to manually go into the device to grab the file. Or if you wanted to get data to the device, you'd have to manually copy a text file to the device. Uh, which is why we always suggest our Connect software, as it's a more automated and also allows you to do wireless data transfers as well as uh, real time in live mode. Uh, Tracer Plus also supports printing. Um, we can actually print, it's new in 9.1, we can print multiple reports from a single session. Um, so you can actually print two different, or three, or however many different formats you want based on you know an item or type of label or receipt that you want to print, you can actually attach multiples to a single session now. And we can print to any printer that uh, either has a Bluetooth connection or uh, has a Wi-Fi or Ethernet connectivity. Same with messaging. It's a similar concept of the multiple reports, but we can actually send emails based on certain conditions or actually email data. Um, we can even text, send text alerts. Uh, if some criteria is met. Um, so that's what the messaging will do. And then in our advanced tab, we can set things like start on fields, key fields, and some editing features. That's what I wanted to cover in terms of Tracer Plus. Because we are a little pressed for times. So I will touch on Connect just a little bit. Uh, so I'll open this up. So Connect is our data syncing tool that allows you to sync data to and from the device uh, with Excel, text, or an ODBC database. What I'll do is create a new project real quick just to show you. If I uh, create a new profile, we have the option to create a sync profile or a live profile. So what that means, uh, a sync profile is something that's going to be sort of a batch type sync, and that can be done via Cradle or via Wi-Fi or cellular, but it's more of a batch sync where you're you know, sending multiple records at a time, and it's usually at a designated time, whether it's a user pressing a button or some time sync that's set up to run every you know, so many minutes or seconds. So once we actually create the profile we want, we can tie a desktop project to it. So I'll select my asset tracker project that we just created here. If I select our desktop project, we click Create Profile. And now we can actually create multiple profiles. Um, so you can, within a sync profile, you can have sync processes. So that enables you to separate the different syncs that you want to do. Um, say if you want to do syncs to device only, you can have that in a separate profile that runs separate from a different profile that may sync data from the device. So we enable you to kind of control how you want to sync um, with these profiles and processes. Maybe this, like I said, this is a sync to device. 
if I add a process, we'll say sync asset list. And then we just want to select a source. Uh, we want it's going to be coming from an ODBC database. And we select from our Windows data sources here. I'll choose our sample that comes with Connect. Let's say we do have an asset list. It's not going to match up to what I created, uh, but let's say it did. And then we want to choose the destination that it's going to, in this case, Tracer Plus. And since we married our desktop project to this, it only shows the two sessions that we have available here. So our asset list, we want to sync to our asset list session. And then we can choose or actually map our fields that they match up. So asset ID could be asset tag, but you'll notice most of the rest of these won't match up because this isn't based off of what I created. Uh, but once you do that, you can actually go to the data viewer and actually see the data within that table that we would be syncing to the device. So in order to actually sync to the device, I'll just add a sync button real quick. Um, so there's a few ways to do this. You can actually add it to one of your sessions, or what I like to do or recommend is create your, a sync session. And we only need one field in that. Start with a canvas, and then you can basically add a button here called, you know, sync to device. And the action we want to set for that You'll see that once we add a button, we have a ton of different button actions here that you can choose from. Uh, but in this particular case, it's a do sync button. And you'll notice two settings that we need to fill out here are a host ID and a profile ID. So the host ID is going to come from this connect area uh, within desktop. So a host is going to be a PC IP address or a PC name laptop, server, whatever you're going to run the Connect software on. Uh, so the Connect software doesn't have to run on the same PC as your desktop. But you can actually run it on a server and even run it as a Windows server. So we can enter an IP address, or if we're doing a cradled sync, we can just type in the PPP underscore peer. And you'll notice that, that host has an ID of 1. So if we jump back over to this, Go to our button. We can now set that sync host ID of one so it knows that when we press this button, it's going to look at this host and it's going to connect to this host. The next thing it's asking for is our sync profile ID. So you'll notice in connect here for each profile ID I create or profile I create, it has its own profile ID. So this one is a profile ID of one. So if we set this to 1, it's going to say, once we press that button, when I press this button, let's sync to this host, and I want to sync profile 1 uh, that's set up within Connect. I'll just delete these fields. They're not going to match up, but I'll just show you the syncing of data. I'm going to change our options to overwrite, so that when we sync the data to the device, it's going to overwrite our um, the, the asset data that I had manually entered. So I'll go ahead and save this as asset tracker. And I'll also deploy my changes to the device with our connect settings. And now we see our sync button, or our sync session, I should say. Now, if we come to our synchronized page, and then I click the sync button, I click this button, you'll see some activity take place here, and it syncs 16 of 16 records. And then if I go to view data, and I go to asset lists, we now have those 16 records. So that's how quick it is to set up a, a quick sync um, to get your data back to the device or even sync from the device. And like I said before, you can even sync drop-down data and even operate in a real-time live mode. Uh, so that's all I wanted to go over today. I hope uh, you got a lot out of this. Out of, out of this, and if, like I said, if you do have any questions, feel free to give us a shout or check out some of our resources. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.